another minute or two and see if anybody else um, logs on. But I will, I will hand things over to our chair for this session, Michael Evans. Great, thank you, Alex. So yeah, I'll go ahead and get started with some housekeeping while we give a couple more minutes for people to log in if they're tuning in just for this session. Uh, so first, I'm Michael Emmons, and I'm an architectural historian, and I'm the assistant director of the uh, University of Delaware Center for Historic Architecture and Design, also known as CHAD, and I'm also a board member of Preservation Delaware. So as most of you probably know or heard earlier, this is the first session of several over the next three days, and I'd like to encourage everyone to tune into those other great sessions as well. This afternoon at 1.30, there's a session on Black historical sites in Delaware, including talks on the Underground Railroad, Network to Freedom program, as well as a fascinating history of ba uh, a Baptist church in South Wilmington that began its life as a Ukrainian Catholic church. Tomorrow at 9.30 a.m., there's a session that looks at current efforts in preservation in Delaware, including work to re rehabilitate the Newark Union Church and Cemetery north of Wilmington, and a campaign to save the fascinating John Brown Mansion in Browntown. At 11 a.m. tomorrow, a session called Beyond Section 106 highlights policy-related strategies for historic preservation, including talks on farmland preservation, Camden's historic district, and new preservation policies in Newcastle County. The afternoon session tomorrow, beginning at 1.30, explores historic preservation and disaster planning, including sea level rise accommodations, resiliency in historic downtowns, and planning for the future in Old Newcastle in light of climate change. Lastly, on Saturday morning at 9.30 a.m., a final session presents findings of an important oral history project to collect people's memories about Black and Native DuPont schools in Delaware. So I hope to see many of your faces in some of those other sessions, which I'm very much looking forward to myself. I should also point out that the Saturday morning session is followed by Preservation Delaware's annual meeting for members. And if you're not a member, I'd like to encourage you to join today. There should be a link in the comments soon here in Zoom where you can do just that. Your membership donation helps support programming like this event and fuels important advocacy campaigns across Delaware to fight for preserving our historic places. On another note, I also want to recognize Alex Tarantino again this morning, who is working mostly behind the scenes to make our session run more smoothly. Alex is a board member of Preservation Delaware, and she has donated enormous amounts of time and work in planning not only this panel, but this entire conference. So thank you, Alex, for all of your amazing work again this year. Okay, so as far as session logistics, as you probably noticed, only our panelists are visible in this webinar format, so we cannot hear or see attendees. Each panelist will present for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have a question and answer session for about 15 minutes at the end. If you have a question for any of our presenters, and I encourage lots of questions, so please submit them, uh, submit that question at any time, as Alex has pointed out, using that Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom interface. I will then relay your questions to our panelists. You can also use the chat function in a pinch, though that should be used mostly for general comments. Okay, so before introducing our first presenter, I'll just quickly mention that I'm excited to chair a session titled Sewers, Peaches, and Malls. Too often, when we think of historic preservation, we tend to only think of the grand architecture or the most famous houses. But to me, one of the most rewarding parts of being an architectural historian and a preservationist is all the fascinating stories that we find attached to everyday, even utilitarian structures, once we start pulling at the threads to get at their histories. How many of us think about the elaborate sewer systems under our feet almost everywhere we walk? And further, that they might be historically significant and represent all kinds of interesting cultural history. Or peaches, which we might associate with a different kind of preservation. But here in Delaware, as we'll see, they were a powerful economic generator and cultural force that produced many of the historic farmhouses and landscapes still with us today. And as for malls, how many of us consider a trip to a doctor's office or a wine shop a historical experience? And yet, shopping malls and their changing designs represent dramatic changes in American society. And the one we'll hear about today almost drips with historical associations, both real and revived. So without further ado, let's hear about some of these fascinating resources. Our first presenter is Anu Kandal, who with her co-authors, Christina Servetnik, Craig Madrigal, and Liza Davis, works for the municipal finance and construction element of the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection 
which administers the State Revolving Fund, a federal state partnership that provides low interest financing to improve drinking water, stormwater, and sewer infrastructure. And every SRF project is evaluated for its potential to affect significant historical and cultural resources. Anu is an architectural historian with an MA in art history from Rutgers University with a concentration in cultural heritage and preservation studies. Christina is an archeologist with an MA in anthropology from the University of Wyoming. Craig is an archeologist with an MA and PhD in anthropology from Rutgers, while Liza is an archeologist with an MA in anthropology from New York University. And with that, I will let Anu take it away. Thank you, Michael. And good morning, everyone. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to present our research on New Jersey's brick sewer infrastructure as a historic resource. Since the early 1980s, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection's Municipal Finance and Construction Element has provided financing for both drinking water and wastewater infrastructure projects. And this quilt symbolizes how the program works. A water pollution problem is identified and municipalities apply for funding to remedy the issue. The next step is to conduct environmental and engineering reviews. And the brick pattern seen here represents the brick sewers as well as our cultural resources review. And once the review is completed and the project is approved, the loan is dispersed and the result is clean water. Our work as part of the cultural resource unit requires us to review every project for its potential to affect historic and, historic and archeological resources. At first, many of the projects that came in involved the construction of new facilities such as treatment plants, collection systems, and outfalls. More recently, the projects we fund are mostly renovation or replacement of older water infrastructure facilities. We realized that as part of our obligations under section 106, we needed to evaluate whether these utilitarian and often invisible structures could be national register eligible historic resources. And accordingly, we have been developing a historic context to inform our management recommendations for New Jersey's older sanitation infrastructure. We focused first on Camden, which like so many other American cities, underwent rapid growth and industrialization in the 19th century, followed by decline in the late 20th century. And this is a postcard from 1946. Camden's oldest brick sewers date to the mid 1800s. But before we kind of get into the Camden sewers and sewers generally, it's important to understand how we got here. Early cities had no systematic plans for dealing with stormwater and sewage, but elementary and often ineffectual drainage systems were built by property owners to reduce flooding from rainstorms. And human waste was deposited in privies or cesspits, and when a privy was filled, it was emptied by workers like bees. And overcrowding and poor sanitation resulted in repeated epidemics of deadly diseases like cholera. And so the priority for many American cities was to pipe in clean drinking water, and that resulted in the construction of sites like the Fairmount Waterworks in 1815. But access to water in houses led to a dramatic increase in the amount of water used, which then had to be carried away from the city. And the earliest sewers simply dumped the waste into the nearest river, and that itself created new problems. And these early cities were then caught in a vicious loop of consuming contaminated water and then further contaminating the water supply. This 1832 cartoon depicts the owner of the South Fork Water Company traversing the Thames River. The water company relied on the Thames River as its water supply. And even though the river received waste from across the city, and you can see that in the drains lining the river. And the people lying in the banks can be seen demanding pure and clean water. And one of them can even be seen saying, we shall all have the cholera. So, bit unfortunate. Even after sewers were constructed in cities, there was potential for their systems to leak and release wastewater into the ground. And here, the leaked wastewater is percolating into the well, and so sewerage becomes beverage. And you can see that leaking from the pipe into the well itself. In the mid 1800s, cities and sanitary engineers were experimenting with best practices for construction and design. Sewers made of bit brick quickly became the standard solution for removing wastewater and stormwater from cities, although other materials such as wood and ceramic were sometimes used. In 1842, an English engineer designed an egg-shaped brick sewer, and over time, small adjustments were made to the shape to make it stronger and better and self-cleaning in low flow situations. And the egg-shaped pipes allowed for higher flow velocities in dry conditions than circular pipes while maintaining a large capacity for wet weather events. And you can see the circular sewer there on the left and the egg-shaped on the right. And just as sanitary engineers were trying to standardize 
optimal shapes and sizes, the state of New Jersey was trying to respond to cholera through legislation. The United States was plagued by epidemics of cholera in 1832, 1849, and 1854. In 1865, cholera had again become rampant in Europe, and so in anticipation of its reoccurrence in New Jersey, the state legislature passed an act relative to the appointment of a sanitary commission in 1866. Camden, too, prepared for the arrival of cholera, with the Camden City Medical Society appointing a committee to address major sanitary concerns, including unpaved streets filled with trash, overflowing cesspits, pigs kept in people, people's yards, and little drainage of standing water. The committee both abated these nuisances and proposed the construction of additional sewers as a mitigatory measure, resulting in only 39 cases of cholera in the city that year, so their efforts had worked out. However, Camden was not the first city to respond to sanitary nuisances with sewer construction. Prior to the passing of the 1866 Act, Jersey City by 1853 became the first city in the United States to plan a comprehensive system that provided clean drinking water and removed stormwater and sewage. And so in this 1880 map, the yellow lines depict the graded streets and most, but not all of the graded streets had sewers. And you can also see that other areas of the city are laid out in a grid though those streets are not graded and nor do they have sewers. Another early adopter of sewers was Newark, which like Jersey City was laid out. And again, not all streets were sewered. Including Camden, seven other municipalities had begun sewer construction by 1866 and the act prompted another four industrial municipalities to construct sewers. So in 1877, an act to establish a state board of health was passed and continuing from 1866 was an emphasis on epidemics in particular. And you can see that an additional two municipalities began sewer construction following this act, um, but not all of New Jersey just yet. In 1881, the annual report of the Board of Health referenced a study by Edwin Chadwick, a English social reformer and urban sanitation reformer which his study demonstrated that government introduced sanitary improvements led to reduced mortality. And so on March 8, 1882, an act to authorize cities to construct sewers and drains was passed. And this really led to a boom of sewer construction across New Jersey's municipalities. And it really doesn't look like much in this map here, but from 1850 onwards, as it was a near steady growth of sewer access and by 1900, 70% of New Jersey residents lived in municipalities with sewers. And you can see that distribution here is isolated to 82 of New Jersey's current 565 municipalities. However, it was not just the state of New Jersey improving public health through sewer construction. Across the country, other cities were building systems in response to their own unique challenges. And in the last 50 years, some of these buildings and sites have been listed for, sorry, have been listed on or have been determined eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places. And all of the structures we surveyed were eligible under criteria A, C, or D, or some combination of them. And this is one of my personal favorite structures that we came across. It's nominated under both criteria A and C. And similar to Camden, the system was built over a century with a multitude of construction methods. And you can see both the brickwork and the stonework in this image here. The system mitigated the threat of flooding from a local stream and encouraged the community to flourish. And in the nomination, they valued the cohesiveness as well as the effectiveness of the system. Constructed parts of the 1853 plan for Jersey City are part of the National Register eligible early Jersey City brick sewer historic district under criteria C and D. Criteria on D is up applicable in the area of engineering, which allows you to really get into specifics like the brick type, sewer dimensions, and construction techniques. Cultural Resources Survey have frequently recommended archaeological monitoring and documentation of historic sewers, which indicates that additional information can be gleaned from sewers, and images like these are usually captured by CCTV. Another aspect of nomination to consider is integrity. Feeling and association are are really an important aspect of integrity for sewers, sewers, since sewers are not meant to be seen, and they are therefore part of the invisible city. As a testament to the workmanship of Newark's brick sewers, the first sewer was constructed in 1852. It was a circular brick sewer. It was five feet in diameter, 1,305 feet long and 23 feet below ground, and it was still in use as of 2001. 
Location, design, setting, and materials are significant, particularly when rehabilitation is carried out. And because of their age, the sewers are frequently in need of replacement or rehabilitation. Newark's historic brick sewers, which are eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places, were rehabilitated in 2005 using cured in place pipe. And you can really see the difference here. Cured in place pipe ensures the structural integrity of the pipe and its continued use as part of the sewer system. And since cured in place pipe preserves the historic material, rehabilitation can be completed without compromising integrity. So taking all of this into consideration, we wanted to evaluate the city of Camden sewer system. Our first thought was to evaluate it as a citywide historic district, especially since the sewer construction very nearly corresponded to the development of the city here. So this is a city in, when it was established in 1828 when a significant portion was added in 1871. Another section was added in 1899. And finally, in 1917, this is the last bit that was added. And sewers have contributed to the broad patterns of the history of the city and the development of public health. However, this is true of all sewer systems, including Camden. For example, sewer systems in Seattle were determined not eligible since construction of the sewer lines were part of a much larger historical trend responding to health and public safety crises. Unless something suggests otherwise, precedence demonstrates to us that the argument is not very strong for evaluating Camden sewers as a citywide historic district. We also considered if sewers could be considered contributing resources to existing historic districts by demonstrating that the sewers are a defining characteristic of that historic district. One example we turn to is Fairview Village. Fairview Village, which was previously known as the Yorkshire Village, was originally built as an industrial housing project for shipbuilders during World War I. And in, nine, and in a 1920 study of four contemporaneous industrial housing projects for shipbuilders, the placement of sewers and alleys in Fairview Village, seen in the top image, was demonstrated as atypical for a federally built industrial housing development at that time. And that makes the planning of Fairview Village's infrastructure unique. In the above cross section, you can see the gas and water lines are located on the main roads, and the sanitary sewer system is located at the rear of the house in the alleyway. Whereas in Union Park Gardens in Wilmington, Delaware, in the image below, everything is located on the main roads, the water, gas, and combined sewer. Additionally, the U.S. Shipping Board's Emergency Fleet Corporation and U.S. Housing Corporation responsible for the construction of Fairview Village, adopted housing standards from Lawrence Bay. He was a housing reform in the early 20th century and included in Bay standards was the importance of sanitation not being managed with privies and cellar water closets. So this meant that no matter what, a comprehensive sewer system had to be planned in conjunction with the design of Fairview Village. And in this example, the sewer system can be considered a defining characteristic of the historic district. Another possibility is to nominate individually eligible components, such as the line ditch sewer. It was completed in 1907 by Aaron Ward, who was a local Camden contractor who had constructed significant portions of Camden's sewer system. And the green line seen here is just line ditch, though he's constructed throughout the city, of course. In Ward's obituary published in Camden Courier, the line ditch sewer was described as an engineering marvel because it was constructed in quicksand. And at a time when most sewers were constructed on timber bases, using concrete or brick for the sewer, or to use wooden, wooden pilings to secure the sewer in the quicksand around Little Newton Creek. And, this, and in this image from the construction site, you can see some of these details. Um, concrete flooring was poured onto a timber base and you can see the timber bases here in place. The walls were made of stone and the top was a brick arch also in the construction. The completion of the line ditch sewer between nearly 100 acres of land fronting the Delaware River with potential for both residential and industrial use. However, more study is needed to determine if this sewer reaches a level of significance for it to be individually eligible. And it might be a little grainy, but Aaron Ward is the man in the center with the bow tie and suit. Um, and the suit is dark and everyone around him is wearing white shirts. As we conducted our research, we became curious about the nomination potential of Camden sewers in the, broadly in the context of the state. And one such approach we're interested in is a multiple property submission, previously referred to as a thematic resource. And it's already been used for citywide sanitary infrastructure, like this one in Rhode Island.
So since Camden sewers are part of a broader sanitary movement across the state, we evaluated Camden sewers as part of a statewide NPS. The geographical area is the boundaries of the state of New Jersey. The time period for consideration is tentatively 1845 to 1910, which encompasses the earliest sewer systems completed in New Jersey, most likely to have been made of brick, seen here in purple, and the latter 19th century also saw the transition away from brick as the primary construction material, giving way to early innovation in non-brick sewers, of which there's a lot spread throughout New Jersey. Sewer construction, however, was not the end of the sanitary movement or major hallmarks in sanitary law. Once public health had improved following sewer construction, the amount of waste, not only from people, but also New Jersey's industry, released into public waterways became the next priority. Most cities followed this idea of disposal by dilution, wherein the waste was disposed in large bodies of water, and therefore it was diluted. So, not the best idea. In 1897, the Passaic Valley Sewage Commission reported that the Passaic River, located in northern New Jersey, was being polluted by 70 million gallons of untreated raw sewage every day. In 1900, the State Sewerage Commission recommended cities invest in the complete purification of waste before disposing of it, and this was addressed by the passing of this 1909 Act. In 1908, the Passaic Valley Sewage Commission began construction on its treatment plant in Newark, and this was completed in 1924, and the boundaries of the site are seen here in red. And the commission would, of course, modify the plant. This is it in 1951. And in 1975, PVSC began construction on new components of the treatment plant in order to comply with the Clean Water Act. The Clean Water Act was passed in 1972 to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters, and it had a more scientific and required more scientific and higher levels of treatment. The act also required state agencies to oversee the building of secondary wastewater treatment plants and every industry to adopt the best technological innovations in order to reduce their discharge of pollutants into the water. And so by 1987, the construction of the PVSC plant was nearing completion. And portions of the facility have been determined eligible as part of the Passaic Valley Sewage Commission, North Bay Outfall Sewage Works Historic District. The structures in red are contributing and some of the lines that you see are the historic made conduits and they run throughout the site. And you can see this um, historic main conduit as it's seen from inside the Venturi Meter Chamber building. And then how it is when it's been partially demolished and it was something we had never quite seen before ourselves. So it's quite incredible to see it. And now let's look at some of the above ground structures. You have the wet weather pumping station, the Venturi Chamber Meter building, and that's where it was an overhead view of the historic main conduits, as well as the architect's rendering of the head house. In addition to the contributing structures, those in blue are more modern additions that are not yet historically significant. The site is subject to continued reinterpretation as the Clean Water Act turns 50 next year. A more recent facility we can look at is the Camden County Municipal Utilities Authority, which constructed its water pollution control facility in Camden in the 1980s, consolidating several smaller plants that had been built as early as 1915. So this raises the question for us, if this treatment plant, which will soon turn 50, if it is eligible for listing on the, Nash, on the New Jersey and or National Register of Historic Places. Frequently, sanitary responses were correlated to legislation. Studying the city of Camden helped us think critically about ordinary sewer systems, those that were not comprehensively planned. And it was not just Camden, as we saw other municipalities constructed sewers, treated waste and expanded their systems before it was legally required of them. And those that we have not even covered here today responded only as it was required of them legislatively. So for us, this dichotomy raises the question if one response is more significant than the other. We've raised a lot of questions today, which is truly reflective of our, of our process. We started by thinking about Camden and its brick sewers as an isolated case study, but it has transformed into something where we are looking at the statewide responses, the later construction of treatment plants, and soon we'll have to consider the Clean Water Act and those responses as well. Of course, if you'd like to get in touch with us to speak about any and all things sewers, you can be reached at the email addresses on your screen. Thank you. And thank you, Anu, for that fascinating 
presentation, uh, I learned a great deal about sewers in that. And uh, I want to remind our audience that if you have any questions about a news presentation or historic sewers, please uh, share those in the Q&A and uh, we will get to those at the end of the presentations and uh, hope to see some good questions. I know I have some. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and introduce our second presenter today. Uh, our next presenter is Tyler Osborne. Tyler is a relative newcomer to the state of Delaware, and she has loved learning about the first state and its rich past. She graduated with her bachelor's degree in history from The Ohio State University in 2017. She has served at a variety of institutions, including archives, museums, historical homes, and most recently, Delaware State Parks. She has a particular passion for outreach and education education and is always excited to present on unique and interesting aspects of our history. And with that, I will let Tyler share her screen and begin her presentation. Good morning, everyone. I will go ahead and show you might see the infrastructure of Zoom for a little bit. Okay. So I'm going to talk today about the history and the rise and the fall of the popularity of peaches in Delaware. So if you're native to Delaware, which I'm learning more and more about, is that peaches, peaches are one of the um, most popular foods in Delaware, second to muskrat and scrapple I hear. Um, so I, I was really interested in how peaches have kind of infiltrated their way into Delaware and as well as I uh, got to experience the Camden Peach Festival earlier this year. And so that was a lot of fun to see that and kind of see the history of peaches as it lives and breathes in Delaware. So doing research, I found that Howard Pyle, he is an illustrator and an author and a native of Wilmington. He was traveling around the area and he visited Wilmington and Philadelphia, and he called Delaware the land of peaches in a, an issue of Harper's Monthly Magazine in 1879. He described the bustling markets that were, that were selling Delaware peaches, as well as the peach factories throughout the state and the industry around the peaches and was very impressed by their production, as well as he very artistically described the aromas or the overall sounds and everything of the market, which was very uh, picturesque. So we know that Delaware was the land of peaches, but we have to wonder how did that happen? And so Major Philip Reibold, he was, one, was a contributor of popularizing the fruit throughout the state. So in the early 1800s, farms across the state, they were struggling and they didn't have any major productions. And so major, the major was traveling and he was a bit discouraged by the lack of agriculture throughout the state. And so he had some money after, he, after the construction of the C&D Canal, so he had some money. And so with that money, he established his own orchard outside of Delaware City. And that really took off. It was really popular. And his success really encouraged other farmers around the state. And he would also travel to Philadelphia to sell the fruits. And uh, he would supply Delaware's uh, Wilmington or other larger cities around the state. His family maintained the popularity of peaches throughout, or throughout the family. And so his grandson often recounted the stories of their family selling peaches or growing peaches. And he tells a story in an oral history about one day his father traveled to Philadelphia to sell peaches, but the vendors refused to pay full price for the peaches. And so instead, and in retaliation, he tossed the peaches over the side of the boat into the water. I guess you could call it the Philadelphia peach party, but it seemed to be, it was an often occurrence in the peach markets. So Major Philip Reibold is an example of the success that peaches brought to different families throughout the state. But then you can also see in these homes that were homes of prominent peach and as other businessmen as well. So in clockwise order from the top left, you have Gover Governor William H. Ross's house the houses of John Lindale, William Cochran, and John Cochran. So all of these men, they worked in a variety of fields, but they were also peach farmers and their fields such as journalism or uh, 
politics really helped and fostered their peach success as well. So you can see just the grandeur of these houses and how peaches help them become so well off in their own worlds. It should be noted that the, the peach success not only was, not only came to those of generational wealth, but it also allowed success to come to different families and people who might not have achieved it otherwise. So Samuel Jones, he was a self-educated African-American man. He began working for the Shawcrosses, who were a prominent peach farming family. They were the largest during um, that time, and he began working for them in his 20s. While he was working there, he developed a lot of skills and know-how of the peach industry, how to properly farm them and harvest them. And then during this time, he also saved enough money to eventually buy his own farm. In 1869, he rented the Clayton family farm, which was another prominent peach farming, peach farming family. And this was actually kind of controversial because a lot of the neighbors were not happy that the Clayton family had rented their land to a black man, but the Claytons stood by Samuel Jones and they were really confident in his abilities. So when he rented the farm in 69, they saw a large return and the market was booming during that time. So he had made a lot of money. And so by 1900, the family had saved up enough money. And so they were already living in their own home on their own farm. And they had their, they had three children and all of them were very well educated and the family was fairly wealthy. And we can see that according to, we have the inventory of their home and there was a grand piano in the house. So there, it showed that not only was it allowing old money and generational wealth families to profit off of peaches, but up and coming families and farmers within the state were also able to achieve this level of success through peaches. And it should also be noted that while Samuel Jones's story is one of great success, he, this was somewhat of an exception for him. As you can see on the stereograph on the right, there are a good number of the uh, peach farm workers. They were often African-American African -American, and they might not have been slaves. Not all of them were slaves, but they were also working at much lesser wages, and but they were also performing much of the workload. So in this stereograph, you can see some orchard workers, and there were two different groups who worked peach orchards. They were split into groups known as the pickers, while there were also the peach plucks. So pickers were described as the skillful harvesters. They took great care to choose and pick the best fruits, and they carefully handled, handled them, although they did sometimes take a couple of snacks. Although there, there were some, the peach plucks, they were often migrant workers, and so they were a little bit less respected in the communities. They were seen as less efficient or less careful, and although their work sometimes uh, didn't do that well, but they were also very needed as their the peach orchards were producing so much they needed extra labor on hand. So these are three bushels of three different bushels of peaches. So these are the different sizes of bushels that you could buy uh, a long time ago, and you can still see these similar size bushels today. And the author John J. Black, he wrote in the 1800s that during the time in Delaware, there were about 40 different species of peaches grown throughout the state, and then they would be sold in bushels like this in markets. So railroads were instrumental in growing in growing the peaches success throughout the state. So in the left hand side, you can see the railroads that go throughout the grow throughout the state and then they go into the surrounding major cities. And so these lines allowed them to really sell their peaches all the way down from Sussex and then bring them up to Philadelphia and New Jersey or even New York at times. And then on the right hand side, you see the Philadelphia, Wilmington and Baltimore Railroad Station about the 1880s. So there were different centers of the peach market in Delaware, Middletown and Kansas and Wyoming were often fighting for the, for the title. And then this is a road right in front of the peach orchard. You can see the peach orchard on the right hand side there 
it's Pfeiffer Orchard from 1923. So that's one of the more prominent, prominent peach orchards in the state. And maybe some of you have even been to their uh, festival. So there are conflicting reports about how many peaches or peach trees there were actually in the state. I've seen as many as millions of trees, but I've also seen as low as 100,000. So although there's some great discretion of how many, how, how many trees there actually were, but we do know that Kent County was the strongest producer of peaches for many years and uh, still kind of holds that distinction in the state. Some of you may know the peach blossom is the Delaware state flower, and it was actually kind of unique how this was decided. So in 1895, the school children voted on what they thought should be the state's floral emblem. And so they all voted the peach blossom. And so you can see the different headlines here throughout the state where they were announcing that these school children had voted for the peach blossom. And then in on May 9th, 1895, the legislation was passed naming the peach blossom as the floral emblem. However, there was some uh, outcry that the peach blossom wasn't actually a flower uh, from some different parties. And then eventually a botanist was consulted and he confirmed that the peach blossom was indeed a flower. And then in 1955, the state legislature decided that floral emblem was not a grand enough title and so they changed the title to official state flower in June of 1955. And then on the right hand side there, you can see a postcard um, from Delaware featuring the seal, a flower girl and the peach blossom. So as many of you, many of you know, President Biden has brought a lot of national attention to the state. And so you can see this is the Hall of Presidents in Delaware or in Walt Disney World. And on the right hand side on that table, you can see the peach blossom featured very prominently beside him. So with so many peach orchards, there were often a surplus of peaches throughout the state. So farms and man manufacturers began canning and jarring the fruit and this allowed the fruit to travel farther and, as, and preserve for much longer. So this is actually a label from a local, local peach orchard or peach canning. And the image on the left hand side, this is from the same story that Howard Pyle wrote about when he was describing Delaware's peach industry that I mentioned earlier. And so he described that women would, in a cannery, they would work together to peel, pare, split, and stone the fruit. And then they would send the fruit up an elevator where it would then be steamed. And after those preparations, it would be ready to can or jar. And Howard Pyle visited this facility around the 1870s and the facility that he visited, he reported produced 30,000 cans of peaches yearly. So peaches have made their way into all sorts of products and sweet treats. And I'm sure you've all been lucky enough to enjoy some of them. Del the peach pie is actually Delaware state dessert. And then you also have the peach ice cream or peach brandy. And then the recipe that you see on the bottom there, that is actually from the DuPont family recipe book. And so peaches were very prominent throughout the state. And so we even had some tunes that were written about the fruit. So I'm gonna play some audio for you. So this was recorded about 1915. So you can see it was very uh, sentimental in the hearts of Delawareans. And so that was recorded in about 1915. That was one version of the song and it was recorded by Albert Campbell. Peach, peaches not only brought great success to the state but there were also a lot of struggles that came with it. So these are two 
newspaper articles that are from the basically the same they're from the same month both from July of 19, 1864 and they recount that the state was hit by a very a very large storm as well as a drought and so both of these events affected the peach orchards almost simultaneously and so you had years like this that were just absolutely devastating to the state's entire peach industry so and they kind of occurred frequently as Delaware's climate is sometimes unpredictable. So events like this made it very troublesome when you were dealing with large port large orchards and an economy that um, was focused on one product. In addition to climate issues, there were also pests and diseases. So in the 1890s, the peach yellows began devastating the crop throughout the state. And so they were caused by aphids, which anyone who gardens or read the grouchy ladybug knows that aphids can cause a whole lot of problems. And so the aphids would bring in the bacteria featured in these two images on the two circles that you see. I, I studied humanities, so I don't know much about science. So I can't really tell you what we're looking at, but I do know that the image that you see on the left-hand side, that is what a peach tree would look like after struggling with the yellows. And after the peach yellows, the industry really never uh, reached its full potential once again, although Delaware remains the second largest producer of peaches in the country and they harvest around 2 million pounds a year. So although it's not as strong as it once was, it still remains an important part of Delaware's heritage and its history and I think still probably holds a very special place in many of your hearts. So that's all I have about peaches. And this is a little shameless plug, uh, Delaware State Parks Cultural Resource Unit. We have a social media uh, pages on Instagram and Facebook. If you wanna go ahead and give us a look and you can check us out. And that's all I have. Thank you, Tyler. And yeah, do follow that account. Uh, that looks interesting. And where, where have I, I have studied a couple of properties that have peach history. I had no idea how rich the history was, so thank you for sharing that. Um, and I want to remind everyone that if you have a question about peaches or peach history for Tyler, uh, go ahead and share those in the Q&A button below and we'll get to those after this last presentation. Uh, and so speaking of the last presentation, our last presenter on this panel is Catherine Morrissey. Catherine is the Associate Director of the University of Delaware Center for Historic Architecture and uh, Design, at, uh, or CHAD, so she's my colleague. She's an architectural historian who holds an MA in Urban Affairs and Public Policy with a concentration in historic preservation, and is currently a PhD candidate in preservation studies at the University of Delaware. Her dissertation work, entitled How Buildings Change, Historic Preservation and Material Integrity of Early Historic Districts, focuses on quantifying and analyzing material change in small historic districts in the Mid-Atlantic to understand material, material replacement rates to historic structures. Additionally, she teaches courses in architectural documentation, vernacular architecture, and methods in historic preservation for the Historic Preservation Certificate Program at the University of Delaware. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Catherine. All right, thanks Michael for that introduction. I also just wanted to thank our host Preservation Delaware and especially Alex Tarantino for putting on this multi-day symposium about historic preservation issues in our state. And as an aside, I cannot let it go. Tyler will have to talk offline about you going to OSU. So with that, I'm gonna start my presentation, hopefully. All right. In a full page ad placed in Wilmington's The News Journal on October 22nd, 1965, builder Emilio Capaldi announced the official grand opening of his newest shopping center, Independence Mall, just north of the city of Wilmington. Be it known to all, the ad reads, that the Independence Mall cordially invites all citizens to a grand opening and open house on Saturday, the 23rd day of October, and continuing through the following week, that all may see how Independence Mall blends the informal charm of our colonial heritage with modern facilities for your shopping convenience. The main attraction awaiting guests at the new mall was a grand detailed reproduction of the famous Independence Hall in Philadelphia, which served as the striking visual centerpiece for the U-shaped shopping center. 
The planned events for the week-long celebration of Independence Mall's opening, like the mall itself, relied heavily on ties to the colonial American past to entice attendees and shoppers. Besides being invited to tour the reproduction Independence Hall building, replete with an exact replica of the Liberty Bell housed on the building's first floor, guests could also visit the colonial era recreations of famous buildings from Philadelphia, including Old City Hall, Philosophical Hall, Library Hall, the Letitia Penn House, and Carpenter Hall. Uh, adding to the colonial appeal of the site was the location of the new shopping center sitting directly adjacent to Gunning Bedford Jr.'s house, Lumberty Hall, historic home to one of Delaware's signers of the U.S. Constitution in 1787. Other early American themed attractions for visitors included hostesses dressed in colonial garb, Surrey rides, and a number of other door prizes. Far from a kitschy marketing gimmick, Emilio Capaldi envisioned Independence Mall as a new Delaware landmark, a destination shopping experience that could immerse visitors in a recreated past and even educate them about Independence Hall and early American history without having to visit Philadelphia or Colonial Williamsburg. As the mall was being finished in 1965, Capaldi planned ongoing guided tours at the site, replicating the tours popular at the time at several open air museums. A journalist covering the construction of the new mall confidently observed that, quote, when, oh, when completed, it will be a Delaware landmark, end quote. Capaldi himself told reporters that it was his sincerest hope that Independence Mall would make such an impression on visitors that it would soon become a part of the lore of Delaware. Independence Mall is an excellent local example of the early American movement. The early American movement that followed World War II witnessed the proliferation of architectural expressions channeling colonial or early national styles to celebrate American traditions. Though most scholarship about the colonial revival movement has focused on the period between 1876 and 1940, the revival of American themes in architecture and the deck arts did not cease with World War II and instead experienced a widespread resurgence and popularization during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. While many people associate post-World War II America with modernist and contemporary design movements, which conscientiously broke away from such earlier tradition, the aesthetic fascination with early American history and its designs and icons never truly faded. In fact, it seems to have surged to new heights during the 1960s and 70s as a more popular and more widespread movement among middle class and even working class Americans. The decades after World War II created a perfect atmosphere for embracing comfort of tradition and for celebrating the idea of American exceptionalism. The 1950s, besides ushering in an era of rapid suburbanization and its cultural upheavals, witnessed high political tensions during the Cold War and its attendant celebration of American capitalism, democracy, and history. The 1960s experienced unprecedented social turmoil and disorienting social movements, including the counterculture, women's liberation, Black and Chicano rights, the first major gay rights protest, and the assassinations of John F. Kennedy, his brother Robert Kennedy, and Martin Luther King Jr. During the following decades in the 1970s, a political and economic malaise took hold in the United States as problematic developments like defeat in Vietnam, the Watergate scandal, and economic stagflation often soured the nation's mood, along with ongoing culture wars and heightened concern about American morals and social stability. During these decades of rapid change and social turmoil, Americans frequently turned to their past for a sense of national pride and stability. The awareness of and orientation to the past was most famously expressed and enhanced by the historic preservation movement, culminating in the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 and the American Bicentennial celebrations of the mid 1970s. In academia, historians began to shift to the new social history, focusing on the past lives of everyday Americans. 
However, the celebration of American traditions during the 1960s and 70s went far beyond the passing of historic preservation legislation, national celebrations, and academic developments, expressing itself most powerfully and extensively through consumer-driven activities, including tourism, pop culture, and especially real estate and home goods. Americans traveled to historical destination sites like Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia, Greenfield Village in Michigan, and Old Sturbridge Village in Massachusetts, and they visited local historical sites in droves. On television, historically themed programs like Bonanza, Gunsmoke, and Little House on the Prairie transported Americans to earlier and presumably simpler times in the nation's history. The early American movement manifested itself most extensively in people's houses and commercialism in the domestic sphere, thus drove the post-World War II early American design movement. Through real estate sales, the renovation of old houses, furniture sales, and the marketing of a large array of new products that reflected historical themes. Capitalizing on this commercial interest in early American design, many builders of new commercial buildings literally followed suit aesthetically, building comfortable and familiar familiar colonial commercial buildings, often citing these new commercial buildings on the edges of new colonial inspired subdivisions. Oftentimes these new commercial buildings, especially shopping centers, were built by the same developer as the subdivision with the commercial buildings reflecting the architectural treatments found in the new housing development. Like their newly constructed residential counterparts, early American commercial buildings seamlessly blended colonial inspired design, new construction materials, and the conveniences of modern technology. These commercial buildings typically featured only select elements of early American architecture to achieve a particular look, idea, or sentiment, and this resulted in entirely new building forms. While the idea of a colonial era or a colonial inspired shopping mall seemed somewhat contradictory, colonial style architecture was actually a common design motif for 20th century roadside buildings. In the early 20th century, newly mobile Americans, especially city dwellers, sought to escape the heat, noise, and dirt of the city by touring pleasant landscapes. For some auto excursionists, the interest in the countryside was enhanced by the presence of historic places along the road side. Early efforts to capitalize on hist history-oriented tourists were created in the 1920s and 30s, including historic markers programs, colonial sightseeing day trips, and even historic house museums. Additionally, antique mania took hold in the 1920s, and antique collectors discovered that the motor car greatly facilitated their journeys to remote districts for treasure hunting. These seekers of antiquity needed suitable places for dining, refreshment, and lodging. Many of these early travelers dined and stayed in early inns left over from stagecoach days. By the 1920s, several old taverns were brought up to the standards of a discriminating and comfort-loving public. Newly renovated roadside inns provided the genteel traveler an alternative to roadside food stands or diners, which were notoriously masculine and rough. Soon, purpose-built roadside commercial buildings sprung up along the roadways to capture these new motoring tourists. The largest of these colonial-inspired roadside chains was, of course, the Howard Johnsons. Historian Lawrence Levine has argued that Americans were, quote, torn between the past and the future, that they could enjoy the freedom of new morality only by surrounding it in the verities of the past. Similarly, Americans who delighted in the speed and independent mobility of the modern car often pulled into a colonial inn or a gas station, which seemed to reassure that while transportation had been revolutionized, the underpinnings of American culture remained intact. This need for reassurance continued after World War II as well. Scholars have only noted in passing a construction boom of colonial-inspired commercial buildings in the post-war period. Art historian William Rhodes has stated that enthusiasm for colonial forms did not end with the rise of modernism in post-war America, pointing to the continued use of colonial cupolas and white trim on gas stations and supermarkets in the 1960s and 1970s. 
This renewed interest in colonial gas stations was not surprising. By 1960s, a rebellion against modernist roadside architecture had occurred. Landscape historian John A. Jackal went the farthest in trying to understand the rebellion against modernist commercial buildings and the newfound interest in colonial designs in the post-war period. He states that the porcelain and plastic gas stations built in the modern style met with disfavor from planning and zoning commissions, in addition to criticism from the general public during the 1960s. As a result, several oil companies began to design gas stations that blended into the new suburban landscape. The National Petroleum News stated in 1960, the so-called icebox look is out. While most of the designs of gas stations still use a basic metal building, they mustn't look like metal, end quote. Instead, the industry magazine advocated for the use of rustic features like cedar shakes, bricks, and roof overhangs. Many colonial gas stations of the 1960s and 70s were purpose-built, but earlier gas stations could also easily be remodeled. While these scholars have pointed to the continued presence of colonial style architecture well into the post-war period, to date, there is no scholarship that defines this overarching architectural design characteristics, especially for commercial buildings. Independence Mall is the most prominently cited and arguably the grandest example of an early American commercial building in the state. Emilio Capaldi crafted an elaborate and distinct shopping design destination with a colonial American feel by reproducing the architecture of historic and iconic Philadelphia buildings arranged in a U-shaped layout to simulate an intimate early American village. Grafting colonial architecture onto a modern shopping center form, Capaldi sought to recreate the feel of the past, warmer, more charming, and with more character than much of the modern commercial architecture in the area. While touting the authenticity of both the building and the experience, though he was, in fact, creating a type of commercial site that had never existed in the past. The main design concept deployed at Independence Mall was the extensive use of replicas of colonial era architecture from Philadelphia. Though many of the original buildings Capaldi replicated were freestanding, his careful arrangement of them as an attached building allowed them to be connected through hallways and for individual businesses to occupy more than one building facade. This individual facade segments employing contrasting roof lines and a variety of exterior wall treatments, including brick, stone, clapboard, and board and batten siding, give the building the appearance of a layered colonial village. While the construction of Independence Mall was perhaps seen as gimmicky by some observers, the impetus behind the construction was far more complex. Emilio Capaldi was a first generation Italian American citizen. For Capaldi, love of his country, American history, and colonial architecture were a balm to the stress of everyday life. In an article about Capaldi and the Independence Mall project published in the Philadelphia Inquirer magazine in 1964, he stated, quote, whenever the pressures of a new business threatened to get me down, he said, with a laugh, black eyes flashing, I didn't take a tranquilizer, I took a trip to Philadelphia, so I could relax and amble through the streets and admire the old homes like when I was a kid, end quote. He stated that on one of his frequent trips to Philadelphia, where he spent hours sketching colonial era buildings, he conceived the idea to replicate Independence Hall as opposed to the new strip malls, he said, which are springing up everywhere. They leave no impression on you after you leave them. They're sort of long gray lines with dits and dots of neon, right? That's why I wanted to build something different, something that adds to the overall appearance of my city, end quote. After he completed Independence Mall, Capaldi planned a second similar replica shopping center, this time in Delaware's state capital of Dover. In fact, Capaldi had hoped to build an Independence Mall in every state across the country. A 1965 newspaper article discussing the construction of the mall notes the shopping center would be built on similar lines to the Independence Mall. However, the city of Dover did not approve Capaldi's initial vision, stating that the proposed steeple would detract from the charm of the old state house and legislative hall. Unfortunately, Capaldi passed away before the second shopping mall project was complete. While the state of Delaware purchased the building in 1966, it never truly replicated Independence Hall or Capaldi's first colonial-inspired shopping center. 
overwhelmingly observers at the time felt that Capaldi was successful in creating an authentic early American replica. And the mall was frequently praised for bringing character style and national pride to a commercial corridor. A Winnetor Museum employee and art historian, John D. Morris, he praised on Capaldi's efforts, noting at first he was, quote, bound to look askance, end quote, at the project due to the replication of Independence Hall, but went on to state that after visiting the mall, to his surprise, he, quote, enjoyed what he saw. He stated that the mall offered, quote, color, form, texture, the sound of music, and voices of people, end quote, not found at other shopping malls in the area. And for him, this amounted to, quote, an aesthetic experience. Morse concluded his article by stating that he far preferred the good reproduction of a past architectural style over the modern architecture of other contemporary shopping malls. While Independence Mall is the most prominent example of an early American shopping center in the state, they were somewhat common, at least within Newcastle County. These early American shopping centers shared a variety of architectural Architectural characteristics, including the use of brick or stone veneers, white trim, cupolas, shutters, and a variety of facade treatments imitating historic villages that developed over a period of time. The earliest known example of an early American shopping center in Newcastle County is Fairfax Shopping Center, built in 1950 and also located on Concord Pike, just one half mile north of Independence Mall. Conceived by Wilmington developer Alfred J. Vallone, the project was developed in conjunction with and intended to be a suburban center for commerce for the Fairfax subdivision of colonial inspired homes developed just to the east of the shopping center. An article published in, Wilmington, in the Wilmington Morning News announcing the near completion of the shopping center and des described it as quote, conforming to the colonial Williamsburg type of architecture, end quote, further declaring it, quote, a shopping center the likes of which is seldom found in this part of the country, end quote. Created in, in the mid-1960s on the heels of Independence Mall, Possum Park, which was re later renamed Liberty Plaza, is designed with the colonial village aesthetic, though is much smaller in scale. The original complex, sited just east of Newark along the Kirkwood Highway, is arranged in two linear sections forming an L shape with the portion facing the road boasting the more village-like look. After A decade after the creation of Independence Mall, brothers Joseph and Mario Capano developed Peddler's Vill Village, a smaller but similarly Williamsburg-inspired colonial office and shopping center. Located within the actual colonial crossroads village of Christiana, the Capano suggested that the design of their complex would in fact, quote, complement historical interest in the area, end quote. In the mid to late 1970s, Powder Mill Square opened in Greenville and in name pays homage to the nearby Eleutherian Mills and Powder Yard and historic gunpowder manufactory dating to the early 19th century. The shopping center and business complex takes on a similar colonial village aesthetic akin to Independence Mall, but on a smaller scale and with somewhat less elaborate architectural flair. Even after America's bicentennial and the popularity of early American design, colonial inspired commercial architecture continued to appear on the landscape. One example, People's Plaza, a shopping center located in Glasgow, illustrates its continued application in commercial design. The earliest and original portions of the complex constructed in the mid to late 1980s consists of long colonnaded plazas with brick storefronts and features hipped roofs, central pediment cross gables, and large ornate cupolas. While strip malls and shopping malls are not evocative cultural resources most people, to most people, they have an almost ever-present permanence on our landscape. They represent many important historical trends of the post-war period, including suburbanization, car culture, and of course, consumption. These buildings were created in response to changing social and settlement patterns, and at the time they were constructed, they were a unique and new resource type, even though they're still constructed today. But beyond the shopping mall's importance to the development history of the United States, Independence Mall is also emblematic of more than just that. Emilio Capaldi viewed Independence Mall as a spectacular monument to the American past, a stylish place for commerce in the present, and for Delawareans as a focal point for the future. Thank you.
And thank you, Catherine, for that wonderful presentation. We're all going to be driving around looking anew at all these commercial structures that are themselves now historic. Um, that's great. Uh, so I'd like to encourage all of our panelists at this time to uh, feel free to pop back on video and um, unmute when um, when they need to, uh, to answer some questions. We do have a couple of questions that have rolled in for all of the presenters. I also, before I forget, want to um, just point out that um, this, this conference and this session was sponsored by uh, Tetra Tech, so we thank them for their support. And I also want to remind everyone that recordings of all these presentations uh, should be available shortly on the Del uh, Preservation Delaware YouTube account and possibly on the website. So uh, if there's something you want to rewatch, you, you should be able to do that here shortly. Uh, so I want to go ahead and get to the first question, which came in from Debbie Martin, and she asks the folks that presented on the sewer uh, stuff, after studying this topic, is there anything that modern sewer engineering could learn or relearn from historic sewer construction? Tricky question. <laughs> um, the answer is absolutely. We, uh, throughout the course of our research, we came across a study out of Lueb in Belgium, and it was a um, many engineers working on this project where they looked at the survivability of historic sewers and used that in turn to inform their decision making and their thought processes about modern sewers. They looked at factors such as the, um, the slope of the sewers themselves, the material that was used, they compared brick and concrete, as well as the age of the sewers to understand just when expectations could be there for replacement or rehabilitation of the sewer systems. You can always learn from the past. Uh, thank you. Okay, so the next question uh, came in for Tyler Osborne and asked, um, how did you get started on researching Delaware's peaches and its history? And um, is it part of some larger study? And is, are there any publications or documents coming out at any time soon that you're aware of or from you that um, relate to the peaches and its history in Delaware's resources? So how I got started on this project is I was invited to speak at the Camden, Wyoming Peach Festival. And so I kind of catered this more towards them originally, but then I was really proud of the work and I was really excited about it. And I thought it was really interesting. And so I wanted to uh, be able to make it more applicable to a wider audience. And so I, I'm not working on any publications and I don't know of any publications. I did find the, um, I, I think Jane, James Black, I think is his name. He was the most, he was, it was an older publication, I think maybe from the seventies or so, but that was the most comprehensive publication I found on Delaware peaches and included um, rundowns of all the different species as well as the diseases and how to properly cultivate them and things like that. So that's how I got started. Great, interesting. Uh, okay, moving on to our next question. Um, there's actually a couple questions similar. So uh, a question came in for Catherine. Is Independence Mall on the National Register of Historic Places? And another question was also whether you're aware of any other shopping malls or those kind of things that are on the National Register are being preserved. Hi, hey, all right, great question. So this research actually came out of a National Register nomination, which my colleague Michael and I are in the wrapping up stages of editing it based on some comments um, that this was a project that was paid for with a certified local government grant from Newcastle County. And I know that our historic preservation planner is on the line today. Hi, Betsy. So thank you for letting us look at historic shopping malls um, for this grant. Um, we found a very few that are already listed. There is an NHL um, shopping center out in, I believe it's uh, Highland Park in Dallas, Texas. We found one outside of Washington, DC. A couple years ago, we attended the Maryland Historical Trust um, Architectural Fieldwork Symposium. Someone was working on a nomination there for Edmondson Village in Baltimore. So I think people are increasingly interested in the topic. There isn't a lot of scholarship, let alone other National Register nominations to kind of build off of, which makes this project even kind of more exciting for us. Great. Uh, another question for Anu and her co-authors. Someone just asked, is the presentation on sewers available in print form? Um, so beyond this video, which will be made uh, available shortly, I, I think it's a good question. Are there any publications coming out of your study or, or a place where people could learn more about historical sewer? 
Absolutely. We're actually um, looking to put out a publication that's available for public access on our Camden research, and we are working on um, other work as well simultaneously. So once that's out, we would, of course, make that available and share the link. But as for today's presentation, we'd be happy to send it off to anyone who would like to have a copy to see and review. Fantastic. Okay, moving back to Tyler, uh, David Madsen asked, where did you get the info about Samuel Jones and did he actually grow peaches himself? He did, thank you for that question. He did grow peaches himself. He actually, where I got the information from is a, oh, I'm trying to find it. Um, I think it was, someone did a digital exhibit. I can't remember what institution it is right now, but I could find that for you. Um, someone did a digital exhibit on different uh, peach aspects and she featured Samuel Jones. And so she had a lot of great resources that featured him, including that signature. Um, and so he did, eventually he bought his own farm and his family cultivated that own, that farm after he received training from other farms as well as renting a farm from another family. Great, thank you. A uh, question from Don for Catherine. Um, where was Emilio Capaldi's proposal for another independence mall located in Dover? Um, any other info about that? I don't remember the, off, the location off the top of my head. I think it is included in our National Register nomination, so I could get back to you. The building has been demolished, and I think from historic aerials, what we can tell is only kind of the center part where the Independence Hall replica would have been was built. Um, the blueprints that kind of showed that long strip mall with the two flanking wings, that part, most of it was never built. So um, we weren't able to find any kind of historic photos even showing it built, but the historic aerials show a very small footprint and the building is no longer um, standing. Thank you. And yeah, my memory of that was that that was right along Route 13 maybe, or very close, like adjacent to Route 13 is where that was located, though I could be wrong. Um, another question for the um, sewer presenters. Um, were there specialized New Jersey brick factories that produced all of those bricks that were needed for all of those sewers? And, and yeah, I, I don't remember if you covered that, but were there any specialized bricks that were used in their sewers or was it just pretty standard brick? Um, so broadly speaking, that's first like a great question and something we um, delved into in our report itself. Um, so to speak about New Jersey's brick factories, we do know that there were some in Camden and Sarahville and spread out throughout the state. Brick um, production was a industry of the state. Um, but to speak specifically about factories that produced bricks that were then used in sewers, we don't have an um, exact answer. But that is something that we are looking to for kind of a future research question that um, can be answered. Um, also, the bricks that were used, there were two types of bricks that were used. Paving bricks were used in the sewer systems, as well as vitrified brick. And vitrified brick was used for the real interior of the sewer because it was resistive to the corrosiveness of the water and other materials in the sewer system. And um, of course, both had their own different production processes, such as um, vitrified brick would be fired at higher temperatures. Um, another thing that was happening with a lot of the contractors that we read about is that they were producing the bricks on site. And Aaron Ward, who we mentioned in our report, he's kind of an all around Renaissance man. He, uh, he made a pat patent to produce bricks on site and then immediately use them in the sewers themselves. So that was kind of an interesting find also about the innovations that were taking place with brick production. Great, thank you. I'm really looking forward to reading your guys' work. This is, this is fantastic. Um, back. To Tyler, um, Ruth Ann asked, um, do you know if anyone has written about how the import of peaches and peach cultivation influenced the demise of indigenous pawpaw? Have you come across anything like that? I have not. I, um, I saw that question earlier and so I, it's really interesting to me. So I would love to do some more research around it, but I don't know any much about it and learning about trees is, and fruit and agriculture is new to me. So I'm really excited to learn more. And if I find anything, I'm happy to share it with you. Thank you. OK, 
Okay, I see Charles Jennings wrote a pretty lengthy one also for Tyler. It's saying in the 1840s, Philip Raybould constructed the first Peach Mansion, which apparently was a Delaware regional variation of the Greek revival style. Formerly, Peach Mansions occurred with some frequency near the C&D Canal, but now there are a few examples. Have you ever heard the term Peach Mansion? And can you tell us anything about how the style differed from other Greek revival houses other than being built by peach growers? How do they get their name Peach Mansion? I don't know much about that. The only thing that I would think it might be connected, and I'm not, this is a guess, so I would defer to the architectural historians, but I know, I believe it is Governor Ross's mansion is still peach colored. So I know that some of the houses that some of the mansions were pe the painting, the exterior paint was peach colored or was a pinky tone. So I think that might contribute to it. But other than that, I'm not sure what that would refer to. Yeah, and I'm not an expert in it e either. But when I moved to Delaware, I, I remember hearing about the Peach Mansions. And, and my impression was that it wasn't necessarily related to any architectural style, but was essentially referring to this kind of burst of mansions that occurred in the areas you talked about that were funded by Peach Profits. And so I think when you hear Peach Mansion, I think um, one example, Ackmester, um, north of Middletown, I think is, is considered a peach mansion because uh, General Mansfield, who built that one, um, was grew peaches, I believe. And, and he, that, that was a kind of a much different looking house than a lot of the peach mansions that you showed in your presentation. So I think it's really just the origins of the wealth that built the mansions. And that's why they're called peach mansions. I could be wrong though. Maybe someone has tried to tie particular styles or trends to those mansions that I'm just not aware of yet. I think it's uh, an interesting thing to look into. 